Thank you, Hannah. Good morning, everyone. I'm here again. Surprise, surprise me too. I didn't find out until, uh, hang on. I didn't find out until, um, just hang on here. Sorry, I need a new stand. The legs come completely off. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here again. Uh, this is uh, our final instalment of Colossians, so a privilege to be preaching really this uh, final message uh, of this letter that we've been going through that we've called Alive in Christ. Uh, so let's, um, let's pray and then we're going to have a look at what this says to us this morning. Lord, thank you that uh, this is your word, and Lord, we want to hear it. Uh, Lord, pray work in our hearts to hear it well and to uh, respond to it well uh, in your way. As you call us, as you shape us by your word, uh, help us to know what it means to be alive in Christ and what it means uh, from Colossians to be alive in Christ. Uh, and Lord, pray that we wouldn't just uh, hear it as words on paper, but as your living word to us even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, right, I need some volunteers. I uh, need quite a few, so if you're thinking about it, I'll probably end up um, at David's first again. You're going to get the same name as earlier this morning. Right, this is our first. We want to have a bit of a look at these names, this list of names we get at the end of Colossians. Uh, first one is Tychicus. Now, you'll realise with hard names in the Bible, you just say them as if you know exactly how they, how they are pronounced. So, um, that's, that's a good lesson to learn. Tychicus. Um, now, Tychicus uh, accompanied Paul through Macedonia. We read about him in Acts 20. Uh, he went on ahead and he waited for Paul in Troas. Uh, and he was then uh, sent to Rome as well, uh, sent from Rome to deliver these letters. This letter and a number of others, probably Philemon. Uh, and so he was the mailman. Good. Right. Who else wants to volunteer? I'll deliver Christmas presents to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Let your yes be yes, David. Who else wants to die? Yep. So you are now Onesimus. Okay. Just pause there. You, you, I'll have one for you. Onesimus uh, was a slave of Philemon. So we meet Onesimus in Paul's letter to Philemon. And he ran away, didn't he? Uh, Paul met him in prison in Rome. And uh, he came to faith. And Paul disciples him and then sends him back to Philemon. Where did Philemon live? In Col Colossae or maybe Laodicea. Uh, hence the connection here in this letter. So he was a defective slave, but he found grace. Okay, the next one we meet on this list is a guy called Aristarchus. I now name you Aristarchus for the time being. He was a faithful companion of Paul on his missionary journeys. He went on with Paul even to Rome where it seems he was also in prison with, with Paul for some time. And, sorry Aristarchus, it seems like you were martyred under the persecution of Nero along with many other <laughs> Christians. Here's an easier one. You might know this guy. Who wants to be Mark? Mark, where are you? Thank you. <laughs> Mark travelled with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch and on to Asia Minor. Uh, he actually came head to head. He had a disagreement with Paul because he didn't like the idea of God's grace going not just to the Jews but now to the Gentiles. And so they had a disagreement uh, and they, they parted company. But they mended their relationship and Mark went on, of course, to do what? Write the gospel according to Mark, yes. So Mark is somebody who we see a restored relationship. One rule for being up here, David, is you have to be quiet. Tychicus doesn't say much when he's standing in front of church. Okay, next person who wants to be justice. Just us, not justice, yes. Come on up from down the back. I'll, be, I'll need another one soon. Uh, so justice was a fellow worker of Paul as well. Fellow worker of Paul, a Jewish convert, and a great comfort, Paul says, a great comfort to me. Peter, you're no longer Peter, you're Epaphras, or Epaphras, you can stand over that side, it doesn't matter where you are. 
Uh, so Epaphras was with Paul for part of his imprisonment in Rome. Uh, he was instrumental, in fact, in bringing the gospel to Colossae and likely other surrounding towns in this area. As Paul says here, he worked hard in prayer and ministering and discipling, getting alongside people in the churches in this area. He was a hard worker for Jesus. Someone else, please? Yeah. Good. Luke. Welcome, Luke. Come on up. I love how uh, the phrase that's used in this letter when Paul speaks of Luke, it says the beloved physician, <clears throat> but this is actually quite a term of endearment, really. It's, it's, if we translate it literally, it would be pretty much like saying our dear Dr. Luke. You can almost hear the kind of relationship they had in terms of between Paul and Luke and in in he, what he calls him. And so we obviously know Luke. He wrote what? Luke and Acts, good. Uh, most of the New Testament. He also travelled uh, extensively with Paul, didn't he? And he was a faithful servant, evangelist on Paul's journeys uh, together as they travelled. Um, and, and Paul tells us in 2 Timothy, in fact, that Luke was his only compa companion in prison for some time. Then there was Demas. Who's Demas? Lily's Demas. Yeah. I saw you trying to avoid eye contact. <laughs> yep. Uh, De Demas was a fellow worker with Paul, also based in Rome at this point in time, as this letter's being written, and he worked alongside as Paul was in prison, probably um, perhaps voluntarily um, joined him in prison for some time, it seems. Nympha. Who's man avoiding eye contact? Come on, up we come. Man or, man or woman. Yeah, we've got two more. I saw someone else getting up, so you'll be next, the last one after this. Nympha was... Uh, at, Likely a woman, there's a little bit of uncertainty, but I'm pretty sure she was a woman, uh, a wealthy Christian in Laodicea who opened a home, generous, hospitable, and... <laughs> uh, generous and hospitable, and it's where the church was meeting, uh, as you can hear in this, these final words of Paul and Colossians. Colossians. Archippus. Final one. There's ten names mentioned here at the end of Colossians. He was actively involved ministering in the Colossian church. Uh, Paul calls him his fellow soldier, in fact, in the work of the Lord. Fight, so he was fighting for the gospel. So we have these ten people lined up, um, considered uh, worth mentioning at the end of Colossians. Uh, so often, if you think, what do we do when we read these letters and read Colossians and you get to the end? When you get to these names, what do you do? Yeah. You think, oh, it's just the names now, and you kind of flick through them quickly and get to the end. Um, but I think it's important to pause on these people here and think about what do we notice? What do we learn from this that we, uh, as Colossians closes off today? Well, what I notice, one thing I notice, is that actually we see some pretty ordinary people here. Pretty ordinary people being listed by Paul. You know, sometimes we think uh, that the Bible kind of parades the saints, you know, and, and uh, here's, a, here's one of those saints, and we kind of think that they're, they're these holier, holy, holy people that we have no way of reaching, and so uh, they, they look like that, apparently. Um, and so that's what, these are the people the Bible speaks of, and we're really nothing like them. But here, though, I think we get to see something different. I think we get to see some ordinary people, normal people, hardworking, sure, yet faithful people who knew Paul, who had traveled with Paul, who had met Paul in prison, who had come to faith and discipled by Paul. But they're ordinary people, making the church the church, sharing the gospel, encouraging others, faithfully serving. And so we could say that, yes, they're ordinary people, but, but, a big but, they have been captured, if you like, by something extraordinary. And that's the point. We so often read about the Bible and think how great they are, but we get it wrong. We should be thinking how great God is. Just look at this group of people. Just look at this group of people. 
We know a bit more about some of them. Demas, it's Demas. Demas walked away from the faith some years later and was caught up with worldly pleasures, it says. Mark, as I've mentioned, left Paul over a disagreement. Uh, Onesimus, we've heard already, was a runaway slave. He took off from Philemon. Sure, came to grace, came to faith after that. And who knows what other struggles and setbacks that they endured or sin that they carried, these people. But this makes them ordinary people, doesn't it? Makes them ordinary people living in a fallen, broken world. Sinful, but therefore ordinary. They're not superhuman. They're not free of sin. They don't have some special direct line to Jesus. They experience failure and broken relationships and struggles. They're ordinary men and women. So on that note, you can all sit down. Thank you. You can take those with you. Keepsake. They are ordinary men and women. Yet what we are seeing here at the end of Colossians is that they have been captured and transformed by something extraordinary. By the gospel. The gospel of grace. The gospel that makes ordinary people extraordinary. That makes dead people alive even. Because what are we calling this series through Colossians? Alive in Christ. Exactly. In some ways it seems we are getting to meet these ordinary people here at the end of Colossians uh, because they are living examples, if you like, of what it means to be alive in Christ. What it means to come face to face with the extraordinary. What it means to hear and believe the extraordinary truth of Jesus Christ that this letter tells us about. If you remember, we, we uh, went through Colossians 1. Verse 15 following says this, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. And it goes on, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace by the blood of his cross. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. That's what God has done. That's who Jesus is. And these are the lengths he has gone to to save a people for himself, to redeem a church, to restore creation even, to make people who would otherwise be under judgment, lost and alienated from God, as it says, alive again, quickened, animated, attuned to the things of God instead of the things of the world. Alive in Christ through faith. This is the message of Colossians. This is the message we've been hearing through this series. This extraordinary God makes ordinary people alive in him through Christ. And this is picked up on uh, as we moved into the next chapter of Colossians. Chapter 2 verse 12 following says that having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, alive in Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is extraordinary. This is the extraordinary truth that we see these ordinary people uh, list at the end of this letter, outworking, ordinary people, extraordinarily transformed by the gospel, ordinary people who simply and completely trust in Jesus and seek to live their lives his way and not their own. And this is not unusual, in fact, to see this ordinary side to the people that we meet in the pages of scripture. Just look at Jesus' disciples even. They were a ragtag bunch of ordinary people, weren't they? Before they met Jesus, even as they met Jesus. I often am struck by the kind of mundane scene that we are presented with in Matthew 4 when Jesus is walking along the sea, uh, along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And there out in the water are Simon, Peter, and his brother Andrew. And what are they doing? A 
very ordinary thing, aren't they? They're casting out their net. They are ordinary fishermen going about their daily work. But also it paints this picture of something extraordinary. Because straight after Jesus sees uh, another two brothers as well, James and John in a boat with their, with their dad, Zebedee, mending nets. Again, the most main, mundane and ordinary thing to do. But yet again, something extraordinary happens. Because what does Jesus say to these four? Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, these four ordinary men do an extraordinary thing, don't they? They drop their nets and become extraordinary men of faith. Not because they were extraordinary human beings in any way. No. But because God worked an extraordinary thing in them through their encounter with the living Jesus. That's the truth. That's what's extraordinary. And we see this down through history as well. Recently I read about another fairly ordinary guy called Martin of Tours. Has anybody heard of Martin of Tours? He, uh, he, he lived about um, in the 300s AD. And in about 340 AD, he was enlisted along with thousands of others into Constantine's army. But he didn't agree with the wars and he struggled with, with that. And so one really bleak winter's night, he actually took off his cloak uh, military coat, and he cut it in two, and he gave one half to a beggar. And so started this extraordinary life of an ordinary man, because soon after he left the army and he, and he ended up living for some time as a hermit just outside Tours uh, on his own, but many people came to visit him. Many people came and lived around where he was living. And so there was a whole village that started being there and started uh, hearing his uh, preaching and his way of life, seeing his way of life, and so started reforming the church as he spoke out about the excesses of church and about the hedonism of co the prevailing culture. Uh, he ended up being made the Bishop of Tours, and he continued in his reform of the church as in that place. Uh, his fame spread throughout Europe. His funeral was attended by thousands, and his influence actually continued for decades and in some places for centuries. But I still couldn't help but notice as I read about his early life and about him as, as a man, just how ordinary he was. He was an ordinary guy, but someone again who had met an extraordinary God, who had come face to face with Jesus Christ. And so he was alive in Christ and showed that and acted that out. Do we think it is any different today? Just like this list in Colossians of ordinary men and women who are working and ministering in Col Colossae, just like when Jesus called the disciples, just like Martin, the reluctant soldier, God still uses ordinary people, even today, to do extraordinary things. Ross just shared a testimony of exactly that. Extraordinary things for God's glory. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. That says we are like common clay jars. Ordinary clay jars. That carry this glorious treasure within. So that the extraordinary overflow of power will be seen as God's, not ours. God does extraordinary things for his sake. And it's the same God, the same God who still does this, the same God who still calls and forgives us, the same God who still transforms us and makes us alive in Christ. To do the work of the gospel today, just as it was being done in the first century when Paul wrote this letter. Like these people in Colossians, to share the gospel to encourage others, to faithfully serve, to be generous and hospitable like Nympha, to walk alongside others, to pray, to minister to those in need. And I know so much of this goes on every day in this church, through its ministries, through its people. This is the extraordinary work 
of ordinary people who have encountered the living and life-giving Jesus and believed. I guarantee we could write the end of this letter with names of people from this church inserted instead. In fact, we kind of just did. They were standing up here. And so because we can see ourselves in Colossians, we also need to hear these final instructions that are given by Paul, don't we? Given by Paul by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to ordinary people, to God's people, then and now. In verse 2 of this final chapter, we read, God's word speaking to us, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And verse 5 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that's so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. These are pretty ordinary instructions. But ordinary instructions that are ongoing, if you look at how it's written, they're ongoing, they're standing orders, if you like. Uh, continue steadfastly, it says. Continue, keep doing it, keep praying, being watchful with thanksgiving. Walk and keep on walking in wisdom. You can't just be wise one day and decide you're going to be a fool the next, right? Always be gracious, it says. Always, not just to people that are easy to be gracious with. Uh, season with salt, so that you may know how to answer how you ought each person. And it speaks of how we can uh, speak out to those who don't know Jesus as well. This ongoing sense of listening to Jesus and obeying these really ordinary instructions. But if you think about it, they cultivate a deeper love for God through prayer and trust and a deeper love for others through how we speak and how we interact with those around us and those especially who don't believe. And so what happens as we do this stuff? A growing ab ability for ordinary people to be God's extraordinary people. Loving God and loving others doing God's will, serving, ministering, encouraging, walking alongside, helping, telling people about Jesus. Just as we see these people doing that Paul lists at the end of this letter. So although I might be at risk this morning of the accusation of preaching a pretty ordinary sermon, I'm not worried. Because the message this morning is that out of the ordinary... God does extraordinary things through those that are alive in Christ. That's the end of Colossians. So as it says in the final verse, grace be with you. Amen.